kind of fellowship, that Father, that allows us into your presence, Lord, that sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, that we may have eternal life, as it says in Scripture, for all those who call on him by name, salvation come by no one else except through the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that is made possible through, again, your grace and your mercy. And Lord, as we open your word today, Father, our desire is not to go, oh, yeah, read this before, but Lord, speak to us afresh and anew, Lord. Speak to our hearts and minds. Show us, Lord. Lord, what do you want us to learn today? Father, we may be effective for you, effective in fellowship, effective in service, Lord, effective in our call into evangelism that you call each of us to, whatever way, shape and form that takes. And Father, as always, I pray the words I speak will be your words, Lord, not mine. Amen. So you want to open up your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 12 and... Um, We'll have a quick look through just the first few verses there of uh, Abraham. I, I purposely avoided the part where he, he lied to Pharaoh about his wife because I thought that was too difficult. We don't tell lies in church, so I thought we wouldn't preach about that one. But uh, just the early part, and uh, it was interesting too, so before we go on, uh, the guys here last week, and, and uh, Richard said, oh, you can head out to kids' church now if you want to go, and someone turned around and said, Wes, you can go too. What are you still doing here? I reminded Wes that several times since I've seen him, that uh, he's tall enough, he qualifies height enough for, um, for junior church, because everyone knows Wes, he's about this big. So. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sari with him, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had and accumulated and the people they had acquired in Iran and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. One of the shortest passages of scripture about adventures of people in the Bible. Normally they repeat themselves four or five times, they tell you all about the arduous journey, but it says they left and they arrived, so obviously it was just next door. So obviously it wasn't such a big deal for Abram to do this, but that's not what we understand. We could look at it that way. But it's about the call on Abram's life. I don't know about your Bible. My Bible actually has got the title at the start of that verse, uh, chapter 12, The Call of Abram. And, um, you know, it's sort of a bit of a cheaty bit, I suppose. But I looked at the aspects of the call and I was praying. I said, Lord, what does this mean for a church in the 21st century? You hear me say that a lot, I know. But what does it mean for us? Because we could read that and say, oh, he was a man of faith. He's Father Abraham. He has many sons. Many sons has... Father Abraham, I am one of them and so are you. And so we say, well, this, this is nothing for this guy. But for each of us today, we operate in such an intense way in, in our circumstances of our daily life that when we hear God's call, do we respond? Do we perceive it as God's call? Or is it just another option that we get? Another option that we can say, well, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Logic comes into it and it's not going to work. And I believe as the church to be effective, we need to be able to listen to God's call because he will change things in the blink of an eye and you change direction. I always say to folk, if you're going to leave the church, if you want to move on, come and talk to us, pray and we'll pray over you and send you on your way because that's God honouring. Because if God changes the direction, we want to know about it. We want to be excited about it. And as a church, we may have to change direction soon. I believe God is building up for something like that. I have no idea really exactly what it is, but I know when we get there, I'll just, I'll just quote the Abrams um, aspect and say so that's the act we're going to live in. So let's have a look at this piece of scripture and just see what God is doing. The sense of call has been something that's been around for a little while. Maybe the Bible started it. In the world wars, it was huge. And if you type this into a search engine, you come up with these sorts of things. The Lion of England roaring, saying, Answer the call, enlist now. 
because they needed people all through the empire to come forward and help in the war. And we sort of celebrate that kind of, don't we, in a few weeks' time? At 4.30 in the morning, when we gather at the Mother's Memorial, or Weeping Mother's Memorial, wherever it's called in town up here, and lay wreaths and listen to a prayer, and, and guys do their gun thing. Griff, you're going to do it this year, or are you sacked? Yeah, you're a few seconds late last year, weren't you, with the gun twirling thing? <sighs> Sorry, mate, didn't mean to bring it out in public. Um, but we have this opportunity of just thinking, okay, so we think about what it means to answer the call. Now, I don't think there's anyone in our cohort here, in our group here, who has been to fight in war, who answered the call and just volunteered. If things got so bad in Vietnam, they actually had to conscript people. They picked your name out of a hat. I think that's how they did it. All I remember is when I was about 15 and the Vietnam War was on, I'm thinking, oh, please change something, somebody, because I don't want to go and fight. And then by the time I got to 17, they changed the whole act and they took conscription off the table. And I thought, oh, phew. Because I did hear a rumour that they went from March to September. So all the people born outside of those months didn't have to go and fight. But being and answering the call can take many forms. Quite literally, men marched from Cambuya and, and um, Alra all through up to Toowoomba, then marched all the way through down to the Brisbane showgrounds and then got on a ship and went overseas. You hear about those sorts of things, Milne Bay stuff. And they reenacted the walk, some of the um, cadets reenacted the walk last year. How do we answer the call to God? That is the question. As a country, we have a bit of an ethos in it. We have a bit of a, a, a character sort of a connection to that stick up for your mates sort of thing. But how do we answer the call that God lays in our heart? How have you answered the call that God's laid in your heart? And as a church, leaders, we need to take notice of this stuff. How do we answer the call that God lays in our heart? There are notable calls in the Bible. Um, I won't go into too many details, but Isaiah, when he was confronted by God as the prophet, and he said, I want you to take the message, his response was one of those ones, here I am, Lord, send me. And he said, hang on a second, Isaiah, I need to give you the message first. He actually had a vision and a dream leading up to this. And then when God said, I need somebody, yeah, pick me, I'm going to go. So he was pretty keen. He heard God's call. He got involved. Jeremiah was a bit more reluctant. He heard it, looked at it, thought, oh, I'm a bit young, Lord. I can't speak properly. And uh, we had a bit of a leaders meeting for youth group last yesterday afternoon at my place and we were talking, talking at, looking at lesson plans and how to give a devotion and all that sort of thing. And I said, fellas, there were only blokes there. I wasn't being discriminatory. I said, fellas, I'd really, this would be great if you could preach one day. If you to use this as a line to preach. At, what, at which point most of them lost the piece of paper in front of them <laughs> in my very eyes. He was 30, he was too young, but God had called him. He had reservations about his own ability, but God had called him. And then, of course, we've got Ezekiel where he says, Son of man, go. And so it, it really straight away spoke into his life and it was motivated and off he went. There's lots of others in the Bible. There's Jonah. It was what they call the reluctant prophet in the big way. He actually went 180 degrees the other way and took off for Spain. And, of course, the disciples, Jesus called them in their way, various ways. And they were a work in progress. That's why we love the disciples so much, because we can identify with being a work in progress, because we're not, all, we're not complete yet. And as God calls us and gives us direction about our life and our ministry, we know that there's stuff that's got to be knocked off, it's got to be honed in and got to be brought into place. The first thing about we well, notice about Abraham is that you have to break the comfort zone. When you hear a call from God, inevitably... It's a lot of times it's outside of what you're used to. It's outside of your experience, outside of even your expertise. And God says, I want you to do this. And so your comfort zone's freaking you out. And you have to step out in faith. You imagine Abram with all that he'd collected in Haran. And it says in Scripture, it gives a bit of an outline. And God said, I want you to go. Straight out of his comfort zone. And to go to the land, I will show you. He didn't even say, look, here's Google Maps. Just type this address in and off you go. He actually said there's an unknown destination there. And that's what scares people so much about being a Christian, I believe, is that unknown of what the final destination will be. Not talking about heaven and hell and all that stuff, but just those little intricate parts about what's next in my life. Because we have a predetermined understanding that things have to change. 
our mates won't like us or something like that or we may have to actually go and do something for them. And that's why it was huge last week we had a lot of these guys who had never been to church unless they've been to funerals. The big fella, Dennis, he's now the club captain. We named him captain on, uh, on Friday night at our season launch and he was very humble about it. He still doesn't know how he got the job. Big lummox of a bloke. But the last time Dennis was in church was at his girlfriend's funeral, Kobe Taylor. And there was hundreds and hundreds of people at the football club because their Taylors are a football fan. We had a guard of honour from the football club and Pastor James did a wonderful job with his message. That was the last time that people associate church with death. And even christenings now aren't the same. Not many people go to church because they do naming ceremonies out in the paddock somewhere. But, and so for them to come outside their comfort zone is so significant. I had a challenge for you. How many of you guys are planning on going to a football game in the not too distant future? Just for the sake of being a presence of God in that environment. It's a tough call, isn't it? Shree's got a plan, by the way. See her after the service. She'll take your name down. And, uh, but it, it, that's, it comes back to that. It comes back to that stuff. There's a personal call where we step out and there's also a corporate call or a group call about how we are perceived and how we want the world to see Jesus through our actions. And if you take someone like this guy jumping out of his comfort zone and moving his whole plant, as they say in um, droving terms, to another place in the country, it must have been huge. But that was Abram. He's a man of faith. He's quoted in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith. Yeah? So that's why it's easy for him. It's different for us because we've got different things happening now. 21st century, it makes it so hard just to be a Christian, to be fair dinkum, not to get distracted, not to bite people's heads off, not to headbutt somebody, not to scream and try and rip their heads off. I did that last week, scared Big Dennis, by the way. I thought it was awesome. They told me about after service. You see, when we think of comfort zone, this is not a donut. All right, no sprinkles. It's not a Freudian slip. A comfort zone is usually a barrier we invent or have something. And, uh, and in that, we have inside it is our wise zone, our comfort, our wise zone. It's wise to stay here. We can list off the reasons why. Abram could have listed off the cattle um, still haven't carved yet. The goats are still waiting for kids. Um, there's still crops to take off, Lord. Um, there's a couple of people that uh, won't be ready just yet. Such and such has to finish school. All these reasons to be comfortable. I know my neighbours. I don't want to move he said go to the land I will show you now we have outside the comfort zone some people call it the foolish zone you're a fool if you go and do that God lays a different direction on somebody who lifts Zechariah on the church and someone brings it to the church and says hey what about this and uh, people go well I don't know and oh no that's a bit foolish we won't go on that area and they think well okay I've got a tough one for you I'm going to throw it out there I want you to pray about it because I know you're going to make a judgment straight away. But what if God said we need to move from here, find somewhere else? We can give 45 million reasons to stay. But if God says move, what are we going to do? I'll leave that one with you. The foolish stone. We've got so many facilities here. Why do we move? I don't know. God might be saying something. And then some people call it the danger zone. Outside the comfort zone is the danger zone. The danger zone is where bad things will happen. And it's not going to be good. And we're going to ask Sarah to step up and close in prayer after the sermon today. You'll be right, Sarah? She's just battering her eyelids. She's still thinking and praying about it. Straight out of her comfort zone. I didn't ask Luke because Luke would knock me down to get up here. Because I knew it's not out of his comfort zone. There's another way to look at that outside the comfort zone area. Not the foolish zone, not the, not the, the danger zone, but the trust God zone. Just step out in faith. Allow God to develop something. Abram didn't know where he was going because, and I say it again, I will show you. That is scary stuff. So this comfort zone thing is a big thing when you're listening to a call. I told you the story about how I got into pastoral ministry. They were really desperate for pastors. And um, they took me. Sheree knew five years before I acknowledged God's call. She said in one day, she said, I think God wants you to go into pastoral ministry. Yeah, yeah, love, I'll just keep teaching. It's fine. 
You just keep praying about it. I'm going to see you now. I'm going to keep teaching because I know everyone in my school. I do a lot of stuff in the school, so I'm quite well recognised and all these things. You know, God slowly over five years broke down those things that I had security in until I had to rely on him. Until at last something happened at that school that has never happened to me before and I thought I've got to get out of here now. And so I applied for another school. And in the meantime, I applied for deputy principal's jobs in other schools. I actually got one. They said, you start Monday week. And on the Friday, I got a phone call saying, you're not starting now. We've given the job to somebody else. And I said, how come? And he said, because that person, because it's going to be in a Lutheran school, and, the, and I'm not a Lutheran, so they are going to move to a Lutheran teacher who'd moved to the area. And I thought, how could you do that? And I thought, okay, trust God. I tried all sorts of things. And he sent me to a school where a kid threw desks at me. No one would ever do that at Burpengary because I was fearful of Mr. Bean. But this kid had no fear. I thought, what's going on here? And then finally, I heard God say, you need to do this. And there was an ad in the bulletin on Sunday that said, wanted admin position, part-time. And I looked at Sheree and she was already looking at me. She was going, mm-hmm. And I'm going... I think I might apply for this. Mm-hmm. I said, yes, Lord. Okay. So I went along and I saw the, el- the deacons. And I was a deacon then at myself. And I said, look, I'm going to have to resign as a deacon. And they said, why? I said, I want to apply for this job. And they said, okay, that's okay. So I resigned as a deacon, applied for the job, went through the interview process. And in the interview, I just had this thing came over me. Spirit said to me, you need to make this a bit more of a step of faith. And I said, oh. They're offering part-time. And I said, look, I'll do this job if you make it full-time and I'll start Bible college. And they went, deal, like that. I didn't even get the words out, deal. And I found out later there were several guys praying that I'd go into ministry, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I started Bible college, the worst Bible college student ever. I know what procrastination is. I invented it. I know what tardiness is, I, all these things. I was so patient with me at Bible college. And slowly the barriers got broken down. So you end up with, that's how you end up with me, guys. So. But even coming here, like we were at for 30 years. Grew up in the church, gave my life to the Lord in that church. And people watched over me, they shepherded me. <laughs> they certainly were patient and showed lots of grace. And then God said, no, you need to me. I was talking to a young lady, I just... I just want to encourage you about how God works in these things. There's a couple at Caboolture Church who we still keep in contact with and, and, and Linda was in our Bible study group and, and now she's um, studying to be a pastor. And, she's, and I was talking to her husband. I'm going to mentor her husband because he's the partner in the situation. And um, I asked him, I said, have you guys thought about a call somewhere else? And he said, no, we've been called to... Linda's been called to Caboolture to be a pastor there, an associate pastor. And I said, you know, when we started pastoral ministry too we thought Caboolture was going to be our church then God's made it quite clear you need to move I think the words you need to use you need to get out of here <laughs> that sounds a bit desperate but he said you need to move so we started the conversation then because people thought we were going to stay because they thought they'd molded us into their image and they got us to a point where they put all this time and effort in and then I was going to leave that's why I commiserate so much with their young people getting married and leave because I know what you guys have poured into them over the years. And so that's how we came here, in a nutshell. But God will do that. He will take you out of your comfort zone. Is God challenging you today about your comfort zone? If not, can I ask you, pray about it. Don't sit in the middle of the donut where it's nice and squishy and toasty, warm and secure. Be prepared for something to happen outside. That's the first part about it. There's another way of looking at it. and We can say the comfort zone is replaced by the stretch zone because God will stretch you. We've got a, a young person in our home group who started teaching and I think it's quite a stretch for her. I've got another one in our home group and I say, oh, we've got another one in our home group who is qualified to be a teacher and I'm trying to encourage that person to step into the teaching role to stretch her. And so we have these understandings about who we are and what we are in our personality. Is God challenging you to jump outside into the stretch zone? Is God saying that as a church? So even that service at dawn on Sunday morning is a bit of a stretch because it's not what we're used to doing. 
When we first did these, you guys first did cows, Chris on William Street, that was a stretch. Doing stuff with backpackers is always a stretch. Doing stuff in the football clubs is a stretch. But God's just, he lists them off and goes, that's good, now we need something more. Be prepared. It's going to come. It's going to be a stretch. And put it in that place, we have to rely on God. And that was a cool thing about Abraham, he relied, I'm sorry, he relied on God. Okay, let's get down to tin tacks. Enough of the, of the narrative. So we understand that getting outside the safety zone and into the stretch zone could be part of God's plan for us. It could not be, but it could be. And the message today, obviously, there's someone, someone going through some stretching procedure here. Answer God's call in your life and how do you do that? How did, how did Abram respond? It said he packed up and he went. He didn't write a list of pros and cons. He packed up and he went. He took everything he could possibly lay his hands on, all his staff, all his family, all his possessions, and he went. It must have been a huge caravan wandering through the desert, wherever it was they went, going to Canaan. Massive, big undertaking, logistical nightmare, so to speak. And when we listen to God's call, we've got to be prepared. In Matthew 10, 22, it says these words, You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Why Jesus said that is that when people respond to him and acknowledge him as Lord and Saviour and step out in faith and do something outside the comfort zone, there's a chance you're going to rub people the wrong way. There is a chance that people aren't going to understand. There's a chance that there will be a little voice in you saying, do you really want to do this? Do you really want to stretch out for me? Do you really want to be part of what I'm doing? And, and, or part of what Jesus is doing? You've got to sort of pray your way through that. You've got to make a deliberate encounter with God in that regard. Because when we acknowledge Jesus, Lord and Saviour, people do look at you different. Sometimes it's easy to go along with the crowd. But when we make that definite step out, be prepared, because anything can happen. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 9, and he said, go and make disciples. He was, getting, he was giving the direction. We follow it in Scripture. We have two ordinances, the Baptist. One is communion, and the other one is to the Great Commission, to go and make disciples. You can't go if you don't leave. You need to leave the comfort zone. Now, a lot of times in history, that has been misconstrued, that passage of Scripture, because that was the one that was flagship by missionary organisations around the world. Because people believe unless you actually went to the mission field, left the country like Abram did, that you actually weren't really living out God's purpose in your life. But for us today, we need to understand that is certainly the case. But it's also, even for us here, sitting in our comfortable pews about what it means to step out for God, about go into a place where there's no believers in Jesus Christ and share the word. Can I challenge you with that today? Is that something you're used to doing? Is there someone God's popped into your head right now and says, share the word? It's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be outside your comfort zone, but they need to hear about me as Lord and Saviour. You can't go if you don't leave. You can't do what God has called us to, what Jesus instructed the disciples to and instructs us to in Matthew 28 if we don't actually leave the comfort zone. And boy, oh boy, it would have been a hard gig for him to do that. In verse 2 it talks about a promise or a covenant. This is the other thing about when you answer the call. God says, he says that he'll be with you. And we call this the Abrahamic, 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 Darren, Abrahamic covenant. Thanks. You sound like you're as good as Bible college as I was. Um, the Abrahamic covenant. That was a promise made with Abraham, with God, the two people in the covenant. And God said, I will do stuff. Obey me and I will do stuff. Take the call and I will do stuff. And so he comes out as this promise and he lists through those promises. God said, I will four times in that passage of scripture according to the NIV. It could have been Hebrew, it could have been different. But when the NIV it says four times, I will. And that's God saying, I will. That's affirmation. Step out, I will. I will. I will. We also understand, reading through that passage, that obedience is followed by blessing. 
So what's disobedience followed by? See, we don't. Un- I think sometimes we don't get the concept. When God says do something, we say is that option B or op- option A or option B, and we think if we take option B, then all we're doing is not doing that. But what we're actually doing is outside of God's will. If in God's will and call we are bl- in blessing, what are we outside of God's will? Unblessed. That's a challenge. Sometimes we wonder why our lives feel so yuck. Maybe it's a challenge to go away and say, Lord, what is the call of my life? You see, we don't, we don't treat it the other way around. We don't say, I need to be blessed, therefore I will. God didn't say that to Abram. He said, follow me, do what I instruct, and I will. And blessing came with that. Now, sometimes the doctrine of blessing is not very well received. Because people think it's like lollies for good kids and think they can work their way into blessing. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that God is a God of grace and mercy and righteousness. And he, uh, he gives us blessing. He applies blessing to our life if we're in his will. If you think about it in quite clinical terms, if you are unsaved, you don't know Jesus, your personal Lord and Saviour, you never prayed the prayer and invited him into your life as Lord and Saviour, admitted you're a sinner and done that, then you're outside of God's blessing. Because ultimately the blessing is eternal life. But outside of that blessing is damnation. It's hell. And there's no two ways about it. That's what the Bible says. You can't beat around the bush in that. You can't draw a grey line on it and be a big fuzzy bit. That's what it means. The blessing is eternal life. So we've got a church full of believers. And God has challenged you with a call today. How do you respond? Do you respond with your own understanding or do you say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you and step out in faith? And with that comes blessing. And you will be blessed. I will bless you, Abram. I will give you many nations. Oh, they'll be named after you. Be a blessing to others. There's all these things we read into that passage of Scripture. You read it for yourself when you get home. Understand about the doctrine of blessing. Obedience is followed by favour. I will give this into your hand. We read that in Scripture so many times. He did it with... Uh, with um, Gideon, last week we were reading about Gideon. He said, I will deliver the Midians into your hand if you do it this way. If you are obedient to my process of eliminating all those people down to 300 so that I get the glory in battle, they will be delivered into your hand. It happens. We read it in Scripture. There is blessing, there is favour when we do what God wants us to do. But what happens, what's the opposite of that when we ignore God? Well, it does make a reference in that passage we just read that I will curse those who curse you. And that's a whole different sermon series. We'll do that one day. At the moment, take those words on point. And I suppose when a push comes to shove, we always are concerned that when we do something and under our own understanding, our own experience and uh, all these things that God gives us, we step out We need to make sure we understand or have that affirmation in our spirit that God is with us and he promised he would be with us. Because what does it say at the end of the Great Commission? And surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. You do what I say. You be obedient to me. You go out and step out and make disciples and baptise them in the name of the Father, Son and Jesus and sorry and Holy Spirit. Then there will be blessing in that and I'll be with you at the end of the age. God's not going to forsake you. If he gets you to jump outside of something, he's not going to leave you hanging. Not in the least. It's easy to focus on just the stuff that's close to us. It's harder to see outside. We just have to trust sometimes. Did I go backwards or forwards? I'll have to have a look. Because he says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others and you will be a blessing through, through you as well. I wonder if you're a blessing to those around you. Because that's the Abrahamic covenant that Abraham, Abraham had, sorry. But are you a blessing to others? Are people blessed by your presence in their life? We like to think so, eh? Oh yeah, people love being around me. I'm awesome. Are you a blessing to others? How does that blessing manifest itself? If you're taking notes, write that down. How does blessing manifest itself? How does it come out? Are you an encourager? Are you acts of mercy? 
See, it's always easy for the people who are who are ex, um, extroverts because they just the life of the party. But us introverts, we struggle with that because we're not the life of the party. We have to work overtime and just make a connection. I have this habit I do now. Every time I see a football player, I shake his hand. I don't know why I've started doing it, but I was like, "Hey, go on." And I thought, I just saw you 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I don't know, just something that happened. But it's making a connection, I suppose. You know, like, we can sit and we can say, oh, well, it's all over Red Rover. But how are we going to be a blessing to others? People around the world who talk about the ministry to the internationals in this church. So obviously that's a blessing to others. But we can't sit in our laurels. We need to bless other people. We need to be a blessing to others as Abraham did. The actions of an obedient believer will be blessed. Matthew 5 talks about those. Do you know that? Does everyone know Matthew 5? What's it, normal, what's it called? The Beatitudes. Thank you for the Bible students there. Well done, Darren. You nailed that one too, mate. Um, let me just read you to these blessing ones. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So they'll be blessed if they're poor in spirit, they'll be kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There's blessing and comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They'll be blessed in their inheritance of the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you thirst for and hunger for righteousness? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That one particularly is about stepping outside your comfort zone. Because you could be persecuted, no worries. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all things against you, or sorry, kinds of evil against you because of me. The last one probably sums up Christianity in the 21st century. As soon as you say anything against any public opinion now, we get smashed as Christians. To the point where we're almost thinking, oh, should we do it anymore? Should we just let God have his way and let the place just go to back and ruin and eventually something will rise up? Or is God calling us to step out and say something about it? The last of all these is Jesus was the ultimate blessing. Is that through the process from Abraham all the way through that that's the line of Jesus. So that's how the nations are blessed because of you. That's how others are blessed because of Abram. Because he was obedient and did that. The blessing went straight through to Jesus. Bit of a jump in the timeline but that's what happened. So then the question is about our call. I changed out to York because... I wanted to be a bit more direct and get myself out of the picture, protect myself a little bit. Not a laugh here, not a smile. Thank you, thank you, Rob Smith. You get that. I really appreciate that. About your call, what is it? Well, the first call is about salvation. Are you saved? That's the first call you need to deal with. Because other than that, in God's favour, out of God's favour, it doesn't make any difference unless you're saved. Two options. One, respond and be blessed. Two, reject and take whatever comes outside of God's love and grace and mercy. I made it quite clear today about how you can come into salvation with Jesus Christ. Express your need, confess your sin and repent and ask him into your life. That can be done anywhere, anytime. You don't have to wait for church service. You don't have to wait for the moon to line up with the stars. You don't have to wait till Christmas Day or Easter morning. You can do that anytime. The challenge is there always. And you can say those words quite simply to anyone you know as well. And then in, in Ephesians it talks about a servant and a servant heart. And Ephesians 6, 7 says these words. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. So when you're doing something, you don't do it begrudgingly, you're serving God. And that's what the servant heart is about, that as well, about your call. Obedience is about go and make disciples. And every person here has got the capacity to make disciples at, one, at, at some stage through. And lastly, 
in Acts 20, Paul saying these words, and, and he says this in Acts 20, 19, and this is just to finish up, and I think this is our last slide, so worship team, you can come out. I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. When we hear God's call, sometimes people are not going to accept we've heard the call. I was sharing the other day that when I finally gave in to God and applied for the job at church, I had to go to the school the next day and put in my notice. So I resigned. Cold resigned. When I went to the staff room and told my unsaved colleagues that I'd done that, they told me I was a fool. You should have taken three years unpaid leave. That way if things don't work out, you can come back. Is that answering God's call? Yeah, no. I didn't know I was doing that. It's just revelation as I was preparing today. But that's what it was about. God needed me to say, no, I'll quit, not take the soft option. Step out. Trust me, I got this. And we're going, I'm going, yeah, okay. And when this guy said, you know what happened? 12 months after I resigned, if I had have just, if I'd have just, taken pay without leave for three years which was a style at the time 12 months after that they offered senior teachers a year's pay to resign and what they call that redundancy package so by acting in faith I missed out on $64,000 before tax so about $30,000 it's a government job and I had a second where I thought, oh man, and God went whack across the top of the head. Boy, Ed, trust me. Yes, Lord. If I had been money orientated, I would have said, no, I can't do that. Because that's just not making sense. Can I challenge you today? You've heard the challenge. I've been saying it all the time. Think about what God's doing in life. Think about as a church. Is there a possibility God's going to change our direction and be prepared to hang on for grim death as we do go on that way? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray, Lord, that as we understand you more and more, as you speak into our lives with greater clarity, as we grow closer to you, and Lord, we experience your grace and your mercy, Father, that we will come attuned to your call on our lives. That, Father, you make it abundantly clear to us, Lord. Lord, I pray, as I got in the slide there, I pray that we will know the Lord's blessing and favour. Because, Lord, we, not because we deserve it, <laughs> least of that, but, Lord, because we're obedient to you. Father, speak to us, we pray. Give us direction. Father, give us the command that, Lord, we will respond. Father, for those in our group here today who don't know you as Lord and Saviour, those who are wearing a mask, those who are pretending, Lord, those who think they may be okay, speak to their hearts today about responding to you. Lord, you'll make it abundantly clear that they need to confess their sin and ask you into their life, that they may receive that blessing of eternal life and a communication and a relationship with you, Lord, that knows no bounds. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us. Lord, as we sing this last song, The Stand, Father, fill our hearts with your presence that we will take these words you've spoken to us today and the words of this song into this week with victory. Because, Lord, we need to follow you. We need to grab hold of you, Lord, and listen to your call. Thank you for your servant, Abram, in your name. Amen. So, folks, please stand and we'll sing.